Here's some help with the experiment 8 post slab. So the first question says, based on your observations, A, is bromine a stronger oxidizing agent than iodine? And explain. In the bottom left, I have a picture of bromine, and in the bottom right, a picture of iodine. So you want to look at these two reactions. These are the last two reactions on your report sheet. For one of these reactions, nothing would have happened. The initial observations you made for the two original solutions would be the same as the observations you made for the final solution. For the other one, something would have happened, and so you want to focus on the equation in which something did happen. Write out the molecular equation for it. If you need help with that, I recommend you go back to the Experiment 8 pre-lab video. And once you have that equation, identify which element is being oxidized. The charge would become more positive as you go from the reactions to the products. And which element is being reduced the charge would become more negative as you go from the reactants to the products. And if you need help with that, I also recommend you go to the Experiment 8 pre-lab video. So whichever element is reduced, that's going to be the oxidizing agent. Reduction happens when you gain electrons, and when you gain electrons, you're taking them from something else. So whatever is, gains the electrons is reduced, and it's making something else oxidized because it's taking electrons away from them. So it's making the charge on that other element more positive. So it's making that happen to another element. So it's an agent making that happen. It's an oxidizing agent. So whatever is being reduced is the oxidizing agent. And if you write out the molecular equation the changing oxidation states or the changing charges note what's reducing and then observe that that is the more that is the oxidizing agent that would be a sufficient explanation for this question part b says is magnesium a stronger oxidizing agent than oxygen and explain in the bottom left i have a picture of magnesium and in the bottom right i have a picture of liquid oxygen so you're going to look at this reaction where you burned a magnesium ribbon in a Bunsen burner, so it reacted with the oxygen in the air. Write out the molecular equation for it. Write the oxidation numbers for each element in the reactants and in the products, and see which element is reducing, which element becomes the charge, whose charge becomes more negative as you go from the reactants to the products. Which ele whichever element is reducing, that's the oxidizing agent. So if you write out the molecular equation, uh, if you write the oxidation numbers above each of the elements on both sides of the equation, and then you note what's reducing and observe that that is the oxidizing agent, that would be a sufficient explanation for this question. For part C, it says, is iron a stronger reducing agent than copper? And explain. On the bottom left, I have a picture of iron, and on the bottom right, a picture of copper. So you want to look at this reaction between that blue copper 2 sulfate and liquid and the steel wool that you put into it. And so you would write the steel wool is solid iron. So you'd write capital F, lowercase e, that's the symbol for iron. And you'd write out the molecular equation, identify the oxidation numbers of the charges of each element on both sides of the equation, and see which one is oxidizing see which element becomes more positive as you go from the reactants to the products. That is going to be the reducing agent. So whichever element is oxidizing, that's the reducing agent. If it's losing its electrons, it's giving them to something else. So it's reducing that other thing. So it's oxidizing and it's acting as a reducing agent. And if you write out the molecular equation and Identify all of the oxidation numbers on each of the elements, both in the reactants and the products, and then point out which one is oxidizing and observe that that is the reducing agent. That would be a sufficient explanation for this question. For question two, it says, why are cooks warned not to use aluminum cookware for cooking acidic foods? Explain your answer using equations. So the general idea is that aluminum is going to dissolve in acid, and that acid will react with the chlorine, the chloride, that's in your stomach acid. So your stomach acid is HCl, hydrochloric acid. And so if you put solid aluminum into that, 
you get two things. You get aluminum chloride, that's a solid, and you get hydrogen gas. And this is just that balanced equation. To show you what that reaction looks like, let me play this video. Here, the liquid is hydrochloric acid. So that's the same acid that's in your stomach. So if you ingested aluminum, this reaction would happen in your stomach. To make matters worse, the, AL, the solid aluminum chloride is a neurotoxin. And there's a picture of that in the bottom right of the screen. And so uh, that is why cooks are warned not to use aluminum cookware for cooking acidic foods. Question three says, by observation, which of the first four reactions gave the most precipitate? Explain how you could determine for certain if this is correct. So this is really two questions. The first one is, which of the first four reactions gave the most precipitate? And that's something that you would have had to have observed in the lab when you performed the experiment. If you didn't observe that during the experiment, there's no way you could figure out the answer to this question. That's just something you would have had to have gotten by observation in the lab. The second part, though, says explain how you could determine for certain if this is correct. And there are kind of two ways to do this, although one would be preferred. The preferred way is uh, is represented by the picture on the right. So you take your solution, and it was kind of a, a mixture of liquid and like these little small dots of solid precipitate in the well, if you remember. So you take that solution and you'd put it in a centrifuge that would and that in a test tube and put the test tube in the centrifuge that would spin and spin it around really really fast. That would make all the solid clump together at the bottom of the the test tube. After you centrifuge it, you could decant the liquid and then weigh the solid precipitate. And that would be able to give you a quantitative assessment of which solution gave you the most precipitate. Another way, which is not, uh, not as preferred, is spectrophotometry. So with that, that's represented by the picture on the left. Here you have a small glass or crystal container. It's called a cuvette. You, put, you would put the solution in there and you'd try to make it as homogeneous as possible. And then you would shine light through it. The less light got through, the more solid you have. So the solid would prevent the light from getting through. And so the more solid you have, the less light would get through. And you can measure quantitatively how bright the light is on the other side with the detector. So if you, some, if you could make the solutions homogeneous, then that would be a way that you could quantitatively tell how much precipitate you got in each one. But the reason why it's not the preferred way is because uh, it's difficult. it would be difficult to make a, a solution of liquid and solid perfectly homogeneous.